first of all, thank you for coming out. I'm Colonel Kevin Kennedy. I'm the base commander, wing commander out here at Ellsworth Air Force Base. And the uh, reason I asked you out here today is just to talk about what is going on at Ellsworth with respect to sequestration and what we're doing uh, with the B-1s. Effective uh, 9 April, local B-1 flying has stopped um, at Ellsworth Air Force Base. There was, uh, the reason we're doing that is simply that we need, across Air Combat Command, we need to ensure that we have units capable to continue to support the combatant commanders in the fight downrange. And to do that, some of our units are going to enter into a state of tiered readiness. What that means is, a, is a, they are going to be less ready to respond to crisis across the globe and it's not a state that the Air Force usually operates in. The reason we don't operate in that state is because it will take up to days, weeks, or depending on how long, months to get ready to prepare to any kind of contingency. And that provides less capability to our combatant commanders. That's not how the Air Force likes to do business. However, that's not the place we find ourselves. So what that means is the 34th Bomb Squadron will continue to fly downrange and support the combatant commander. The 432nd Attack Squadron will continue to remotely control and pilot um, aircraft in the skies of Afghanistan. However, our local uh, combat squadron, the 37th Bomb Squadron, will not fly um, between now and right now we're planning all the way to October 1st until we're going to get that back up in the air. So what does that mean for their uh, qualifications for the 37th Bomb Squadron? 37th Bomb Squadron is going to uh, decrease readiness every day that we don't fly. Be, they, their readiness and ability to accomplish the mission decreases. Um, first, we'll start losing currencies and items. Uh, then we'll lose our status, our combat readiness status. We'll go down to our lowest, lower level status. Then we'll lose our takeoff and landing capabilities. And eventually, we'll have uh, over half of our crew force by October 1st will be unqualified in the airplane and we'll have to have an official qualification program to get them back up on step. Um, we will look to mitigate as much as we can across the base. Um, with that, uh, we're going to use our maximize our simulator that we have on base to make sure that our, our air crew are getting as much as they can out of that device. However, that doesn't get us all the way home with things such as critical phases of flights, takeoffs, landings, air refuelings, things like that. Things that you need actual repetition in the aircraft to make sure that you have the proper safety margin. Uh, we are also going to maximize any kind of ability for ground training and to keep any kind of capabilities we've grown here we need to make sure they're going. Specifically, at Ellsworth Air Force Base and it's also at Dias Air Force Base, we've just started a capability called Hot Pit Refueling, which helps us maximize our aircraft sortie production. But that's a capability that's a, it's a pretty deliberate process between maintenance and operations that we've trained our way into, and we want to make sure we don't lose that capability. Because that's the part that, even though we focus on the aviators, we also have the maintainers have to retain their ability to keep these aircraft flying. We will continue the maintenance on the aircraft with inspections as we're going along, um, with whatever parts are available. However, parts are going to be prioritized just like flying hours, so we may enter into positions where we do not have the parts available to fix the aircraft as they break. The other thing is if we're not flying our fleet, we won't be breaking our fleet and we won't be fixing our fleet. So six months from now, um, if, these, if we haven't flown our fleet of B-1s, we're, we're not really going to have a great assessment of our fleet health, and getting back up and flying them on a regular basis is going to be a challenge. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, bottom line though, this is something that we need to do to ensure that we continue to be ready for the fight downrange. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't hollow out our force and that when you say a squadron is combat ready, it's combat ready. And we're doing our part. The 34th will maintain their combat readiness as they continue to fight. And when they come home, they'll enter in the same status as the 37th when they come home in the middle of the summer. Uh, with that, that's uh, my uh, initial comments and I'm open for questions. Colonel Jack Siebel from uh, KOTA My Town. Uh, we talk about the proficiency of the crews and the proficiency of the uh, of uh, uh, the maintainers. Uh, the, the planes themselves, these are not designed to sit on the runway for five and a half months. What kind of work are they going to have to do day to day to make sure these planes are ready? Um, thank you for the question, Jack. We are going to continue to do our inspections as we normally would, um, our hourly inspections as, as they come due. Um, and we also, every 30 days, we're going to go through a full run out of the ring out of the aircraft as much as we can. But that means just starting engines, bringing all the systems up, but that's not going to put the loads of flight on these aircraft like, uh, like you talked about. So if we don't go and fly the airplanes, we're really not going to know the true state of the systems. And the other part that's it, we're not going to be putting demands into our supply system. So as things start to break, we won't necessarily have the parts available because the supply system has, we haven't put a demand signal in there to get those parts. And the training for the crew, you talk about the simulator. Uh, we, we haven't been able to get into the simulator even though we want to. So I got to ask, uh, are you sure you even have it or maybe it's a big b-hole you guys go to? 
Uh, we do have a simulator. We're actually, uh, we, that is one of the advantages of Ellsworth. We have two simulators and we maximize those and we also have the ability to do distributed mission operations with other bases from around the country and Air Combat Command is prioritizing that and making sure we integrate that capability as much as we can. But the first time they get into a plane and take off, it's going to be a little scary for them after a couple of months off. But we're going to do that smartly and we're going to make sure that we have the folks uh, that we have the folks trained to do that in a safe way, but uh, there is going to be some lack of, uh, of proficiency. Uh, now, we take time off from flying, and we do have requalification programs, but that's exactly what we're going to have to develop, is a program of how we step our folks into it in a methodical way. We're not going to take folks that, uh, four people that haven't flown in six months and then put them on the aircraft. We're going to make sure that we have the right experience on the aircraft to do it safely. It's just that it's going to take some time. Six months down, it's going to take more than six months to recover. What's that, Derek Wilson? Derek Olson, Hello Land News. Uh, what's the, the recertification process that the pilots and flight crews are going to have to go through, and how long is that process going to take after you get these planes back up in the air? Uh, for the duration that we expect our folks to become unqualified in the aircraft, it's a squadron commander directed program for the regulations that we have to fly under. And so it will be tailored based on the experience level and the duration that they've been on, that each individual crew member has been unqualified. So that it's going to be, we're going to make sure we're, we're doing it smartly. So if someone is, a, is fairly new to the aircraft, they'll probably take more sorties um, to get back up on speed versus someone that is more experienced in the airplane, um, a couple of years of flying the aircraft or instructors. Uh, they'll take uh, probably a few less sorties than the other ones. But we're looking at it, it'll be a count of sorties. It's not going to be a single ride. Sir, Charles, I'm going to How much money is being saved over, over this period at Ellsworth? Um, it's a difficult for us to get the money savings. I really don't have a great number for you on that. All, right now, the way we're looking at it is, is, is in hours, 45,000 hours is what we're looking to save so we can make sure that we can put that forward to the combat to the units that are flying the combat. Is there 45,000 hours at Ellsworth? That is, no, that's, that's across the, Air Combat Command. Okay. And the reason Ellsworth was is looking at when the 37th Bomb Squadron was next to be tagged to go forward and fight, which they are tagged to do that next year. There was acceptable risk looking across the Air Combat Command that we could stand that squadron down and still uh, have a reasonable level of, uh, of reasonable level of assurance that they will be ready um, to go back out in January and support the fight. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Colonel Colonel ballpark on how much money you saved? Uh, uh, so we're going to have to get back to that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, okay. I would love to know, too, how much gas it takes for one of these to take off and get to cruising altitude or train altitude. I'll have to ask you later. Okay, yes, you can follow that through. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Colonel, when you were uh, talking, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. I'll go okay. ahead, somebody else. Hey, give it in. So, Bill, is it still planned? Um, the latest on furloughs are still at the de Department of Defense level. Okay, you know, the, there, there are no, we haven't gotten no guidance uh, further than that they're looking into them. There's no specific guidance on days or when that's going to start at this point. So that's still in discussions and that's at the secretary level. So, so last I heard though, it was going to happen in the summer, is that the um, I still haven't point? heard, I haven't been given a new timeline uh, uh, as far as uh, furloughs are uh, concerned. Um, all I do know is it's at discussions at that level and that uh, once they have a, a the plan of how they're going to do it across the Department of Defense. They're going to bring that information from Air Combat Command down to 12th Air Force and tell us. Colonel Katie Urban, DOTA. Do you have any idea what's going to happen after September? There, these cuts don't just end this year. These are set to go on for 10 years. Any idea? Well, the advantage come October, now we'll have a full year and we'll have a budget, um, a new budget uh, for across that year that will help us look at our priorities across Air Combat Command. The way this came down with the compressed timeline and the specific accounts, it really hit our operations and maintenance account pretty much squarely. Um, over the, Once we enter the new fiscal year in October, then we'll have the ability to get the flying hours back and, and, uh, and continue flying at our, a normal, what a nor normal pace is. What that normal pace is going to look like, um, I don't know yet. It might be different going forward as we enter a, you know, times with decreased uh, budgets, but as we as we look at, we will be flying again at Ellsworth Air Force Base in October. And you said you don't like to be at the tier that you're at. Uh, it's all over the news right now what's going on in North Korea, and it's kind of the elephant in the room. If something happens, are we, will you fly? Uh, we will be ready to, when the, if Air Combat Command calls and, and 12th Air Force calls down and says, hey, we need you to get ready, uh, we have some timelines built in that we could start flying operations within a reasonable period of time, and then we would get our crews up on step in a reasonable period of time. It all depends on how long we've been down. Um, if it happened this week, I'm pretty confident. If it happens next week, I still am. But as long as we, the more we go into this period of non-flying, then our ability to, to generate aircraft and crews will decrease. And we'll be looking into, like I talked about earlier, the experience level of the crews, 
and the, and the, uh, the parts level and the, the, the jets and see where they are. Well, Colonel, correct me if I'm wrong, but it takes about one to two months to get a unit ready for normal overseas deployment. But if you had something, it, as you said, the longer you go on with this uh, the, the stand down, the, the longer it's going to take for you to get going. Uh, realistically, you're not talking about a month or two, you're talking about three, four months to get going. Our generic planning factor for a, a bomb squadron to get out of town is about 90 days, three months, is what we like to use for our training program. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Once, as it goes longer, it, it, we'll have to see what the threat is. But uh, bottom line, if the nation needs our B1s, we're going to do whatever we can to get them there. And if there are soldier sailors, airmen, and Marines on the ground needing us in the skies, we're going to do what we can to get them. Does this have any impact on the plans to expand the powder river base in that way? No, not at this time. We're still going to do it anywhere. Yes. Given I've got to ask, first week on the job in this context, how does that feel? Um, I'm still excited to be part of the wing. You know, this is like I talked about last Friday, this is a challenge. Um, we'll work for it. We have a great airman out here. Um, we have innovators in our force. We'll figure out how to make sure that we can maximize our RPA mission. We'll maximize our B1 mission. We'll make sure that we can get it done. And, uh, and we'll figure out how to do that. This is not ideal, but uh, come October, we'll find ways to get us back up into uh, out of tiered readiness and into a state of uh, continual readiness. Overall, how, how concerned should people be about these cuts across the entire military? Um, I can't talk for across the entire military, but as far as the uh, the nation, you know, we just we'll need to take a look at how we're going to. The, the world is not getting less dangerous. We'll need to make sure that we. Uh, we think of innovative ways of how we can provide for our defense and air powers in long range strike and the RPA and Enterprise are good ways to do that. And at Ellsworth Air Force Base, we're going to make sure that we mitigate whatever we can during the next six months and come October, we'll look at bringing our combat readiness back up to continual readiness. We've heard some talk out there that there will be a point where the B-1 will be not called and they don't so we, Does this change that discussion at all? Does it change the, the long term viability of this aircraft? Long term, the B-1, I think, has a pretty good future still. Uh, for what it does and the ability to do long range strike, uh, we, we just don't have the, the numbers yet in the other and across the fleet. Uh, but as we're as we look out, you know, there will be new capabilities, there are ever increasing threats out there, so we'll have to continue to assess that. But today, and for what I see the next 5, 10, 15 years, I, I'm pretty confident to be one to be around doing the mission. I gotta say, when you uh, talk about consistency, is there any specific? Ability, what we provide at Ellsworth Air Force Base, expeditionary combat power, we want to make sure that's ready for the combatant commander, whatever pops up. You know, if, if things, if something such as, um, you know, no one could have predicted Odyssey Dawn in Libya a couple of years prior to that, those are the sort of things. We need to make sure we're ready for the combatant commander so when he needs long range strike and he needs someone um, to help him and the, and the president, it looks for us to, to provide expeditionary combat power and global reach, global power, that we're there to do that.